Today is Thursday, January 27th, and my name is Brandon Springer. I'm interviewing Davis Skaggs, who is a former congressman who helped Boulder Action for Soviet Jewry advocate their cause internationally, um, as well as many, many other things. Uh, this interview is being recorded for the Maria Rogers Oral History Program and is being filmed by Emily Schuster. So, David, my first question is, when and where were you born? February 22nd, 19... 43 in Cincinnati, Ohio, but we were living in Kentucky across the river at the time. And so could you briefly tell us about how you, know, how you grew up and uh, when you eventually came to Boulder, Colorado? Um, my family moved to the New York area when I was a little boy, baby really, and I grew up um, in and around New York City, um, briefly in Queens, uh, New York, and then for all of my schooling years in Cranford, New Jersey, about 20 miles outside the city. Um, was a legal resident there until moving to Colorado, but was not really living there while in college and law school, and then for uh, active duty in the Marine Corps. Um, moved to Boulder because I had uh, had the good luck to visit Colorado on uh, actually a dare from a girlfriend in uh, the summer of 1962 and uh, was about to go back to work for a Wall Street law firm after the Marine Corps and decided that life could be better in Colorado. So moved out here in 71. Okay. Um, and was it better? Yes. Well, I, I, who knows? You know, you can't control these okay. experiments. So I think so. Good, good to hear. Um, so tell me, when did you first meet Bill and Sarah Jane Cohen? Uh, my memory is that uh, Bill and Sarah Jane uh, started their law practice, Cohen and Cohen, um, maybe in 71 or 72, um, and they rented offices in the same building in what we then called the Woolworth Building in downtown Boulder at uh, Pearl and Broadway. Uh, and the firm I worked for was in the same building, and we got to know each other, probably going to the restroom, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> And how did uh, your relationship with them evolve? Uh, well, I'm tr again, um, we were had political um, sympathies that that were nicely aligned. Uh, and then I'm also remembering, uh, it may have been that Bill recruited me to be co-counsel with him in uh, a lawsuit against. Alex Hunter, who was at the time the district attorney in Boulder County, but also had um, an investment in some, I think, low-income housing in Lafayette or Louisville, and there was a case that emerged out of that. I can't even remember the facts. Bill would know. So um, we worked together on that. And then, uh, uh, as I recall, did some work together on Tim Worth's campaign for Congress in 74 when I was was uh, essentially managing the campaign in Boulder County. And how did you get involved in the uh, Worth campaign? I was, at the time, the chairman of the Democratic Party for the second congressional district, so that sort of naturally threw me into contact with Tim when he was first scouting out a race really in, in 73. And so the Coens were also working on the campaign? They did. I can't give you a play-by-play -play of exactly what they did and when they did it, but you know, we were involved together. Yeah. And what are some of your, some of your um, memories of the campaign? Well, uh, it was uh, a come-from-behind operation. Um, people these days don't remember, or m not many do, that Boulder was a Republican city and county uh, in the 60s and early 70s. and so. Um, and the second congressional district was as well. So Tim was trying to unseat a longtime incumbent, Don Bratzman. Um, very tough row to hoe, and 74 uh, was uh, notable because in the summer uh, Richard Nixon was impeached, and uh, the Watergate matter finally reached its climax and a lot of people that didn't have a prayer of winning, probably including Tim, won in November of 74. So that, that was kind of the, the background of a campaign that was a long shot to start with and then ultimately successful. 
Um, and so uh, we know that the Coens had held a march for Soviet Jewry at about the same time. Um, and Tim Worth had been involved in that, and he had marched with them. Um, do you have any memory of that? I don't. No? I don't. Sorry. Okay. Um, so Tim Worth wins the election. What happens then for you? Well, I took a leave from the law firm I was with and went to Washington to be Tim's administrative assistant. Uh, the term, the title that was used in those days would now be called chief of staff. I uh, had a wonderful couple of years working with and for Tim, managed his re-election campaign in 1976. Um, I'm sure I had contact with Bill and Sarah Jane during those months and years, but I can't give you uh, anything more concrete, I'm afraid. And uh, certainly was a, a great education and training for me in politics uh, and in Congress to be sort of Tim's right hand going through his first term and doing a lot of important reform work in Congress and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of reform work? Tim was the leader, maybe just one of the leaders, of the uh, effort that was launched after the 74 election by newly elected Democrats to really um, uh, not quite do away with, but uh, uh, undo the usual seniority system that had really dominated House practice and committee chair selection for ages. Mm -hmm. um, so for the first time, committee chairs were not uh, just sort of migrated by seniority through the ranks to chairmanship if they lived long enough and got reelected enough times, um, but instead chairmanships were elected by the full Democratic caucus, um, which meant that junior members and more reform-minded members had a chance to really hold their committee leadership accountable. Um, uh, Tim was involved in a number of other things, telecommunications, energy, um, but I think the, the seniority system upheaval was probably the most important thing to mention. Can you pause for one second? So how long did you serve with Tim Worth in Congress? Uh, I was uh, his AA chief of staff for his first term and briefly into his second term in 1977. Um, stuck around to hire, help him hire my replacement. Um, but at the time, I was adamant with Tim that I didn't want to uh, get sucked into a career in Washington and wanted to get back to Boulder. And you did. And I did, briefly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so Tim Worth decides to run for Senate, correct? Correct. Um, which was because Gary Hart decided to run for president. Which didn't turn out so well. But um, he, did you work on his campaign as he ran for Senate? No, I was busy running for Congress in 1986, so uh, I had my hands full. Uh, again, the, uh, the complexion of Boulder and that district has changed markedly in the intervening years, but Tim had barely survived re-election in 84. I was running against the guy that almost beat him in 84 when I ran in 86 and was the underdog until the very end and was able to squeak out a, a win with a little less than 50% of the vote. And what had prompted you to run for that seat? Oh, you know, I, I think um, any explanation that any politician gives for why they run for office is inherently flawed, including mine. I, I found um, uh, the ability to work on important public policy at the state level. I was in the state legislature until then, um, and the prospect of doing it nationally was pretty intriguing. Um, it's a cool job, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you don't do this without, you know, some modicum of ambition. Um, but I had found, I mean, I really credit Tim for a lot of this because it was really the experience seeing firsthand what one could do as a member of the House of Representatives uh, if you worked at it. That seemed to make it a, a worthwhile thing to give a give a try. So I did and, um, and squeaked out the win. Yeah. And that was in 1986. Right. Now, Boulder Action for Soviet Jewry had started in 1987, um, started acting, and, and before that they had been working on various things. Um, and you had helped them in Congress. 
I, I, I did. Um, I had not, I mean, I can't place the timing exactly of when I became aware of their work and was enlisted to lend a hand. Mm -hmm. And what sort of things did you end up helping them with? Well, I think um, uh, before the Alexander Nikitin case, which we'll talk about in a while, I think, um, there were just very specific um, persons of interest that the committee uh, focused on and asked members of Congress to take various steps in behalf of. So uh, that could be writing to the Russian or the Soviet ambassador, um, um, generally signing on expressions of support of one kind or another. Uh, and uh, yeah, I forget exactly when it sort of transitioned into a, a fairly determined effort to get these cases um, to be attended to by high-level administration officials so that when uh, there were negotiations and meetings going on between uh, the vice president or the president and Soviet officials that these cases would be on the agenda. And so what, what sort of things did you specifically work on? Uh, I, I'm sort of um, patching this together because my memory of it isn't as concrete as you would like it to be. Um, but what I recall, again, short of the Nikitin case, which was um, a much more uh, long-term and serious effort personally for me, uh, it was really sort of the letter writing, the sending dear colleagues around, um, meeting with Bill and others to, to hear about these cases, trying to get the administration to pay attention. Um, you know, I do recall, but I think it was in the Keaton-related meeting that we actually got the uh, Soviet ambassador to come up and meet with members of the House so that it wasn't just a paper kind of protest. Mm -hmm. And do you recall that meeting? Um, I, I recall that it happened. Again, I'm not, uh, I, th I think it was a Nikitin centric meeting, but it may have been about just the more generic problem of um, Soviet Jewry and the need for exit visas and all of that associated kind of concern. Um, one of the more specific uh, and bigger cases that BASJ worked on and advocated for was that of now Maimon. Yes, I, I remember that. Yeah, and I believe you were the one who had distributed the Dear Kali letter through the House. Um, I think that that is also right, and I'm uh, you know slightly embarrassed not to have you know a, you've had a chance to look at the papers, right? <laughs> uh, um, and I haven't tried to refresh my memory, and my records are all at the library at CU, uh, so I um, I trust your having checked that out. <laughs> And I got to meet him when he got here. And do you remember that meeting? I do. Uh, I mean, I remember meeting him. I can't give you exactly when, where, and what, but um, yes. And it was a treat to see the, you know, the positive outcome of the work. And again, uh, Bill, um, as you probably have experienced, is a um, enormously persuasive and um, diligent uh, and determined advocate. Uh, and I was an old friend, and I was his congressman, and um, you know, when Bill came to ask me to do things, unless there was some reason not to, uh, which I can't remember there ever being, I tried to, you know, I took instructions from Cohen on this stuff. <laughs> uh, a little bit of an exaggeration, obviously, we were careful that um, we were doing something that was appropriate for a member of Congress and other members of Congress to be involved in. Um, but, you know, Bill also had done his own work and, and really laid out, I think, a rationale for why this was um, really important for the United States to, and for the Congress to be involved with. Uh, it was also, um, you know, an appealing proposition for, you know, not that I was um, soft on defense, I don't believe, but it was a nice opportunity to have a different kind of way of dealing with our overall set of concerns in the Soviet Union other than just looking at 
you know, the military to military um, dynamic of the relationship and um, uh, taking advantage of the uh, decision that who I forget who was was uh, the leader in the Soviet Union at the time that they signed on to the Helsinki Accords and and really gave us a leverage point for going after these issues. So then, Bill Cohen was really your connection to right. the Soviet Jury movement. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so, w when did the Nikitin case sort of, you mentioned the Nikitin case, of yeah. Alexander Nikitin, um, when did that come up and could you sort of explain how you got involved in that? Yeah, well, Bill and I had also worked um, together on Rocky Flats matters um, and, uh, and it, of course, Nikitin's case came out of the fact that he, uh, in his work for the Bologna Foundation, uh, had been instrumental in uh, putting together information. Uh, he, he didn't release it. It was in the public record already in various forms. We're putting together information about the nuclear waste dangers and other problems associated with the Northern Fleet nuclear-powered vessels in the Soviet and then the Russian Navy. Um, he was uh, arrested and charged in that case, uh, a clear violation of sort of ex post facto requirements for, for rule of law. And although it was not, um, uh, you know, I don't know what Nikitin's faith is, but I don't believe he's a Jew, and so I don't think, I, you know, I, I don't really remember how the, uh, uh, how Bill became particularly interested in the Nikitin matter, but he brought it to my attention, and it was a compelling case uh, that really resonated with the work that had been going on by Tim and me and, you know, hundreds of others dealing with the eventual closure of the Rocky Flats plant south of Boulder. Um, and uh, Bill believed, and we did some investigation to confirm the fact, and there was also Bologna then had a staff person in Washington that we were dealing with. Um, all seemed to point to the potential good effect of having you know, real attention paid to this case by Congress. So uh, again, there were letters Dear colleagues sent to other members, letters signed by other members um, to, I think, both uh, Soviet officials. And we were successful um, in getting this on the agenda for what were the gore um meetings that, that had become a, um, a kind of hallmark effort of the sort of new relationship between the U.S. and now Russia, not the Soviet Union. Uh, to uh, work through a whole bunch of problems. And uh, Vice President Gore accepted putting this matter on his agenda for a Chernomirden, Chernomirden meeting. Um, can't give you a date on that, but it's, I'm sure, in the record. And uh, as uh, the Nikitin case was moving toward trial, um, folks thought it would be useful actually for there to be a U.S. Congress person observer over there. So I went over there first time while still in office. Um, I wish I could remember dates better at this point, but I think it was in 1998. Um, I was no longer um, running for office and had decided to retire. And then went over a couple of more times after leaving office again to sort of maintain the, the pressure and attention uh, that uh, having a member or former member of the U.S. House attend the trial and, and other hearings and meeting with uh, prosecutors and, and others in the uh, Russian hierarchy in St. Petersburg. And so what are your memories of those trips? Um, well, it, it was, um, you know, a very serious, purposeful undertaking. Um, uh, it was 
startling to me as a Western trained lawyer to encounter what was still the sort of the residues, and I don't know that they've been eliminated even today, but certainly then um, a, a court system that was making some preliminary move toward independence but hadn't quite gotten there yet. Uh, I, um, trying to remember the name of the judge, Goletz, I think, was the trial judge, um, who actually, I think, uh, well, because of the verdict, ultimately uh, took the then still pretty um, courageous step of deciding the case on the merits and not under pressure from the FSB or, or prosecutorial authorities. The, uh, the funniest memory that I have, given that Nikitin was a, a submarine officer and the case circled around primarily uh, the nuclear-powered submarine fleet in the north, uh, was that I went to the courthouse one day, I can't remember whether it was the first or second trip there, but went to the trial court to actually introduce myself to the judge because um, I thought having him know that I was there, if I could make my introduction appropriately, would be a, um, a useful marker to put down. And he actually ha was in his chambers, um, and he, I, I couldn't have told by looking at it, but I believe he acknowledged that he was playing a, a video game having to do with submarine warfare. <laughs> which seems like, you know, an, a, a really remarkable coincidence given the nature of the case. So. And what was his reaction to you, an American statesman? He was very gracious, as I recall. Um, uh, I, I was grateful that he would greet me. Um, didn't seem to be put out by the fact that I was there doing what I was doing, so no big deal. And was that common among the Soviets that you met while you were there? That I was no big deal. Um, <laughs> uh, it depended. Um, you know, we met with the. Uh, I met with the chief prosecutor for the Saint Petersburg district. That was a very stilted and formal occasion, um, and and um, I think the consulate, the U.S. consulate in Saint Petersburg, had been instrumental in getting that meeting set up, and it was. Um, seemed to me anyway to be one in which this man had been um, told it would be a good thing to meet with me, but was not particularly interested in engaging on the merits of the case. Mm -hmm. And um, what was your sort of impression of the, the atmosphere in the Soviet Union at that time? Russia. Yes, Russia, excuse me. Yeah. Was, yeah. Um, well, th this was tough times in uh, in Russia and, and, and certainly in St. Petersburg. Um, you know, currency fluctuations, a lot of poverty. Um, um, my house ha in Boulder in Niwad has a number of paintings that I purchased um, on the street in front of a major church on uh, uh, it Nevsky Prospect, main drag in St. Petersburg. Uh, because artists, and it was a you know it's an art-centered city in many respects. Uh, painters were unable to sell their paintings and were willing to to make very agreeable, from a Westerner's point of view, deals. So I got, um, but it, there was that sense of a very cultured but um, frayed city and economy, a proud city, um, a beautiful city, um, you know, a both hopeful and disappointed uh, environment because of the hopefulness that came out of the disintegration of the Soviet Union and the new openness and yet a feeling that things hadn't really gone quite as they should have yet. Um, I can't recall exactly where we were in the takeover of so much of the previously state-owned industry by the uh, oligarchs, but you know there, there was a, certainly a sense of opportunities slipping through their fingers as far as a real broadening of the economy and the democracy. Mm -hmm. Now, you had mentioned the, the FSB earlier, 
Could you explain who the FSB are and then what your impressions of them and sort of their role in the Russian state? Well, this was the uh, sort of the domestic um, security police, the successor to the KGB, um, and uh, they had been the police instrumentality that had brought the case against Nikitin or prepared the case that was prosecuted against Nikitin. I don't know that I had any direct connection with anybody from the FSB. I, they might not have told me if I had. Um, but uh, what was evident then was that uh, the pretension to any rule of law or, or of, uh, compliance with basic notions of due process were largely overlooked. In what ways? Well, I mean, the fundamental um, proposition in Nikitin, which was the application to conduct of his that had occurred some years before of a, as I recall, fairly ambiguously worded statute about disclosure of state secrets. Um, one was its retroactive ac application to what he had done. Um, and even more perplexing was the fact that what were claimed to be state secrets at the time had been in open sources for years, and so he wasn't. Whatever he'd done, he hadn't disclosed state secrets. Um, so there, anyway, there was just, uh, you know, a for somebody coming out of our culture, a kind of uh, through the looking glass uh, unreality to, you know, how do you get your your mind and arms around a legal system that is able to create its own rules <laughs> for the convenience of the state. And what had the FSB done with Nikitin? Uh, as far as I know, I mean, they, they had, had been the, uh, the agents that had tried to repackage uh, the facts in his case to fit within, uh, in, in the contrived way, to fit within the, the state secrets disclosure statute that he was prosecuted under. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not really um, informed about all that may have gone on, other than that, that they were the the police agency that brought the case. And then, um, was disclosure of state secrets a common thing to be prosecuting um, in the early years of the? the you know? um, I mean, I've seem to recall that there were a couple of other similar high-profile cases um, more or less at the same time period, but I don't, I don't know whether it was a generalized way of getting at people that um, were, from the state's point of view, um, out of line. Uh, and so, but the Nikitin case turned out well for Nikitin. Uh, it, after um, several iterations, right. I mean, it went up, went up on appeal and it was um, uh, as I recall, you know, a favorable decision um, upholding the trial court's uh, acquittal, uh, but under their system, uh, opening it up for re-prosecution, which was initially in the works. I can't, I mean, and then I don't think he, because I went back for for that occasion. Um, what actually happened in the end? Maybe you've looked into it and can remind me. Um, I don't know whether it was uh, that the case was dropped finally under, again, continued detention and pressure, whether the trial court, when charged with retrying the case, basically uh, ditched it. I think, that was, I think that's what happened, but I'm, you know, I'm fuzzy. And then did you uh, meet Nikitin after that? Well, I met him there. At the, um, I, I met him uh, on those occasions, certainly, and um, uh, I was on a uh, task force that uh, Secretary of State Albright uh, put, excuse me, not, not was not hers, it was uh, Bill Richardson, who was Secretary of Energy uh, in the second Clinton administration. And um, he uh, constituted a group of which I was a member that went and to look at securing Russian uh, fissile materials. And uh, anyway, we had occasion to go back to St. Petersburg, and I got to see Alexander then without um, having you know, a trial looming. 
Then, uh, then he came as a fellow to the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington um, early in the last decade, 2003 maybe, I forget. Um, so he was a fellow at Woodrow Wilson and I was able to have him out to my home for dinner and some vodka. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Sue Hardesty, who was one of my congressional staffers who had worked very diligently and passionately on the Nikitin case, was able to join us and get to meet Alexander as well. So it was, it was a, a quite warm and um, affectionate and joyful opportunity to see him in a very different circumstance. So tell us a little about what he was like during the trial and then how he, he changed once you saw him again afterwards. Um, I, I think um, other than uh, maybe a broader smile and a more relaxed um, demeanor, there wasn't a whole lot of change. Uh, I mean, he was just a stand-up kind of guy and uh, in, uh, in a way stolid and um, uh, unflinching during the prolonged prosecution and, and legal proceedings, uh, but always seemed to have a, you know, a sense of balance and perspective and knew he was doing the right thing and um, uh, clearly was uh, you know, a, a brave individual for being willing to do what he did and to have years of his life consumed with defending um, a righteous decision. Um, you know, it's, I, I think he was pleased when he had a chance to visit me at my home and, um, and meet Sue and my wife and kids and, you know, all of that sort of thing. It was just a very different environment than a uh, sort of barren courtroom in St. Petersburg with peeling paint. Um, um, so do you have anything else on the Keaton case that you wanted to talk about? Um, no, I, I, um, I'm enormously grateful to Bill for having gotten me interested and involved in it because it was a very meaningful thing for me to be able to, to help. Um, striking, because I, you know, I, I don't, um, never been taken with the self-importance of a member of the House of Representatives, although I'm sure others would say I was from time to time. Anyway, um, you know, you're one of 435, we come and go, um, you know, no big deal. Uh, but it made a difference to have one of us, it happened to be me, over there for these proceedings and, um, and it had an impact and people paid attention in a way that they might not otherwise have. Um, so I was gratified to sort of be able, being able to carry the American flag, if you will, in, uh, in a way that uh, maybe caused this to turn out a little bit better. Now, um, sort of moving a little bit backwards to the Soviet Jews, um, now Maimon is sort of released from the Soviet Union in 1988. Had you continued to do work for Soviet Jews and then after that Russian Jews once the Soviet Union sort of dissolved, so post-Soviet Jews? Um, I, I did, but um, I, you know, it, it is the blessing and the bane of congressional life that you're doing a lot of things all the time, and so uh, without going back and looking at records, um, I, you know, I couldn't really give you a good idea of all that we were doing in 88 versus 95 versus 98. Um, Somewhere in there, that problem largely went away because the restrictions on exit visas were were lifted, and uh, and the problem was a matter of history, not current affairs. Maybe you can remember when that happened, or maybe, uh, uh, but I, you know, it's clearly things got better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bill again uh, was overly generous in, in uh, crediting the work that me and my office did on all of this. Um, 
say we were we were willing accomplices with Phil uh, <laughs> on a good cause. So then, um, during this period, you were you're, you did mention a lot of the Dear Collie letters. So I'm curious. First, um, was there any sort of struggle in getting those you know, people to sign those, or was there? And then also, what was your in relation to other Congress people and senators? How what was the level of involvement? Um, I, I think um, probably uh, all, a, a whole range of levels of attention and involvement by actual members and senators. Uh, a, a lot of this work gets done at the staff level. Um, there were, I think, a handful of people in the House really known for their human rights work. I, I was not one of those. I mean, I was glad to do some, some serious work um, and hope that it made a difference. But um, Frank Wolf and Chris Smith and Tom Lantosh and, um, and several others were really the, the key people in the human rights efforts among members of the House. The nice thing about this was that it also provided a um, an issue and an area of work that didn't know partisan boundaries. So uh, Republicans and Democrats were able to make common cause in a way that I think everybody was glad to have because so much of the business of the place is um, divisive. And, and why do you think it was such a non-divisive issue? Um, because uh, I think it appealed to our fundamental American values uh, and um, uh, and there was always, um, I think, a, a hunger for some opportunity to stand together as, um, as Americans um, and as American politicians without regard to party labeling. So this, this was um, a, a nice occasion for that to happen. And, and I think people found that appealing as well as the compelling nature of the uh, the human rights violations that we were trying to deal with. Mm -hmm. Well, are there any other uh, memories or stories of working with Soviet Jews or meeting Soviet Jews or meeting other Soviet refugees that you'd like to impart? Um, well, I, I mean, there have been other um, folks that have, have migrated to Boulder that I've met um, back in the 90s. Uh, I, I can't give you a recitation of names and occasions, but it was gratifying to, um, again, under the auspices of Bill and other of his of his colleagues in the community, to see the you know the positive results of, of a lot of hard work. And uh, you're too young, if I can say this, to to appreciate as fully and as viscerally as those of us who grew up in the Cold War years. Um, you know, seeing the wall come down in the fall of 89 was you know, absolutely, you know, a miracle. Uh, I went over again with Bill Richardson uh, on a congressional delegation under the Helsinki Commission work to monitor the East German elections in the spring of 1990. Um, these were things that we would never have dreamed were possible in, when I was your age uh, and growing up in what seemed like you know, a, uh, a permanent state of affairs between East and West. So getting to play even um, a minor role in facilitating uh, the transition um, was, you know, Wonderful, and um, and another time when you realize that, uh, for me anyway, um, you know, I happened to be in office at the time this was happening, but it was really uh, a crusade that good people in the U.S. and in the West had been working on for at that point forty some years. So uh, you just happened to be there when the good stuff happened. Um, and then how long did you serve as a uh, U.S. congressman? Twelve years. Twelve years. So that would mean you were uh, until 
eight. I mean, technically, you you leave office in January of '99. In my case, so yeah. And then, what did you do after that? Um, I started a uh, Center for Democracy and Citizenship, uh, a little nonprofit operation that was affiliated with the Aspen Institute in in its DC offices, and then moved a few years later to another home at something called the Council for Excellence in Government. But this was a uh, an effort to get at some of the root causes uh, as I had experienced them in, as an elected official in um, the, the uh, fragility of American democracy and our attention to our, our own uh, democratic system and, and the problems that come from neglecting um, civic education, um, getting young people involved in politics, um, so it was a chance to kind of work on those public policy issues from the outside, having experienced um, some of of the uh, you know, what's the right word um, the gradual incremental um, lowering of the vitality of our own democracy over the years and realizing that that needs attention all the time. And I did some lawyering and some teaching at the University of Colorado. What did you teach? Uh, a little bit of, con of constitutional law at the law school and political science. Okay. Um, and then how did you get to where you are now? Well, um, in the, uh, I guess it was 2004, um, my wife and I had always wanted to get back home to Colorado, uh, even though we stuck around Washington for a while after Congress, uh, and had bought a piece of property uh, out north of Niwot, and, you know, finally, you know, the kids were grown and married and so on, and we decided it was time to come home. Uh, which we did in 06. Um, Governor Ritter was elected in the fall of 06 and unexpectedly asked me if I would be willing to head up the Department of Higher Education. So I did that for three years, ending a year and a half or so ago, and uh, ended up being affiliated here with this law firm uh, about a year ago and have maintained um, couple of different involvements in the federal government. So I have been chair, I'm now co-chair of something called the Office of Congressional Ethics that uh, Nancy Pelosi set up to help the House of Representatives um, adhere more uh, truly to its code of ethics and, and also am a board member of something called the Public Interest Declassification Board, which is about what it sounds like it would be about, dealing with um, how we get classified information out into the public domain. Uh, well, we've covered a few decades worth of history. Um, so is there anything you'd like to go back and touch on? Any other stories that you'd like to relate? Oh, I think we're, we're probably, for your purposes and for my, my afternoon timeline, um, have, have done okay. If you're, if you're satisfied, I am. I'm satisfied. Okay. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.